Hello, everybody, and welcome to Handmade Hero Show, where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we... <sighs> so, as we often do in Handmade Hero, quite intentionally, uh, often to the chagrin of some people who just want, like, the simplest possible game made as fast as possible, which is another thing you can definitely do, uh, and I don't begrudge people doing it, uh, we like to solve technical problems here, or show how to attempt to solve them anyway. We don't always get a great solution. Sometimes we do. Um, we're at another one of those points where we've done a lot of work actually in Hammer Hero and done a lot of things I think in kind of some interesting ways in terms of harmonizing 2D and 3D. You know, I don't see a lot of people really trying to make perspective uh, rendering work with, you know, uh, 2D inserts in some of the ways that we're trying to make it work, where you can do things like go downstairs and have some kind of perspective bending and, you know, we're trying to do some interesting stuff there and you know, uh, it's a tough thing to get right because of the way that the art interacts with the world. Uh, and one of the things that we haven't finished, uh, I think pretty much everything is working pretty well actually when we look at it, um, that has to do with that. One of the things that we haven't quite finished is figuring out how to alter the Z buffer in a way that allows us to insert sprites that really we don't know the 3D shape of, um, in a way that makes them look plausible, right? So that they don't, so that they do get occluded by things that they should get occluded by, but they don't get occluded by other things that they shouldn't get occluded by. Uh, and we're trying to make that happen in what we would consider a relatively rigorous way. Meaning, there's some ways you can do it which are just about, let's hack it. We'll just cheese as tons of values and have lots of like cleanup in there where we just tweak things until it sort of looks right most of the time and then there's some glitches, right? We're trying to say, look, before we go down that road, because sometimes in game development, you have to go down that road, right? But before we go down that road, what we want to do is say, can we figure out a real solution to this so that we can just do it for once and for all, right? Um, and I thought our fogging, our like alpha fog one, for example, was a pretty good way, you know, when we, when we kind of have our our cool way of going downstairs and stuff now. I thought we'd been kind of doing a pretty good job of getting some of these things like really tight and good. Um, but this one isn't. And uh, so that's really our last thing before we can sort of adjust our sprites. So for example, let me hop this dude down here. Um, and uh, and uh, let me just take a look here. So for example, right? We've got that feeling like really good, you know, and it feels really tight and, and all of the like, you know, fading in and out looks really good and stuff, right? Um, even our lighting is coming along. We just, we don't know how to get it fast enough yet, right? It looks good for where we can afford to do it, but we can't afford to do it in a big enough region to make it, make it good, right? But again, all this stuff seems to be working pretty good, but this is our, see that right there, right? That's the last thing we really got to know how to do, right? We've really got to figure out a good way to, to make sure that we don't get those kind of interpenetration artifacts. Right now, we're not doing uh, anything for the Z bias. You know, we put Z bias in the shader, but we really don't know what to do with it. And so our goal is to solve that last problem, okay? Um, lighting, obviously, is something we need to do more work on, but that's not, that has nothing to do with 2D, 3D, right? That's just lighting is hard, and it's always hard for everybody, always, if you want, you know, depending on how good you want to be. Um, you can make it arbitrarily hard on yourself. But from my perspective, right, what I want to do is, is finally, you know, knock off the last thing on our 2D, 3D list. If for no other reason, then that's what's keeping us from, like, going in and finishing all our alignment points and having all the rest of the art in, right? Because we don't want to bother with that uh, until we know that we're, you know, we're, we're solid there. And again, you can see the camera just so solid, right? It just works really great now. All of the fading does exactly what it should do. Um, you can go up and down levels, even stairs, and it looks great and it's easy to understand, right? Um, and so I'm really, really happy with where the aesthetics are going. Uh, and I think they're, they're right where they need to be in most cases. Um, but we just have this unfortunate issue uh, where we, we don't know how to do that Z. And so that's what we were brainstorming yesterday. We we're like, look, this is the last big thing and it's, pre it's gonna really prevent us from finishing up the art assets, you know, uh, until we do it, how do we do it? Um, and what I suggested at the end of, of the last stream was what if we did something 
where we actually just put the projection into the shader and said that the, that the final coordinate, uh, x, y, z, w, the w coordinate, which was previously just an addition to z, will actually just be a z, the, the height, like the, the z coordinate of the plane, the x, y plane, on which to project the point to get the z buffer value that you should use. Right? Uh, that was our idea. Now, whether or not that idea is good is kind of another question. And, you know, <sighs> I would like to just quickly, or not quickly, but I would like to take a little more time on the Blackboard to talk about what I mean and what the problem actually is, right? Uh, again, just to try and get to a place where we've got a little bit more rigor to it. So if I may, uh, the specific problem that we have, and this is like for our Z occlusion, the specific problem that we have is that the place that we would like our sprites to be sorted is not where they are actually drawn, right? And so if you think about how a Z buffer works, a Z buffer works by drawing, you know, into a screen region, you know, a particular Z value. And then when something else comes in, you know, and wants to draw on here, like, you know, I'm drawing another thing on here, we check to see if its Z value is closer to the camera than the one that we already drew. And if it is, then we'll put it there. If it's not, we don't, right? So what we're really doing is just saying, hey, for every pixel, we're gonna record how close this thing was, you know? Um, and that's what we're gonna use. But the problem with that is that if we then want to draw things, that occupy regions of space that are nowhere near the place they wanted to be sorted, right? So for example, uh, I was drawing this the other day, uh, Friday. If we have something like this, where here's a, a back facing wall, right? Uh, and here's the floor, right? When we're drawing someone here, we want them to roughly sort within this cube so that if there was a wall here, right, we would want this to occlude them, but we don't want this to, right? So this wall should not block something drawn here, but this wall should. Now that would be fine if we were drawing it as a sprite card that actually stood right there, right? That would be very easy for us to do, uh, and it would just work because that's what the Z buffer is meant to resolve it's meant to resolve anything that involves drawing uh, in actual 3D, with actual 3D objects in the actual positions they are supposed to occupy. It does it pretty well. However, what we have is a different scenario. When we want to draw this thing, we actually want it to kind of come out like this, right? Imagine the hero body, right? We want it to come and, and look more like that, right? That's what it should look like. Uh, and then the head should be like up here, right? That means that we actually need to draw out here as well, okay? So what actually happens if we were to do that, right? Well, the first problem is, you know, okay, we would have to know to move this thing out uh, like along Y, I guess, to however far it would take to line up the alignment point with where it should be, right? Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is we don't actually want this much perspective because too much perspective makes them look like cards and we want them to look more like art, right? So the other thing is we have to lie it down like that. And when we lie it down like that, what we end up doing is we end up interpenetrating, for example, something that like this wall back here and clipping into it. So our challenge is figuring out what are we supposed to do here, right? Um, you know, 
what can how can we make this work in some way that doesn't create these kind of problems that's what we're trying to figure out just just fundamentally speaking okay and so there's some uh things we could possibly do there are some ways that we can address this problem and again like i don't really know what the correct answer is um but for example one thing that we could try doing and that has nothing to do with z bias uh, if we imagine looking at this from the side now, so let's suppose that we're just looking at this orthographically. Here's our side view. Right? So here is the wall, uh, and here is the floor. Here is the point, right? This is, this is P. This is the entity point. And we're trying to construct something to draw on here. If this is what we would normally draw, Right, so that would be the sprite card if the card were just stuck in the world. But what we actually want to draw, right, doesn't have that level of eccentricity. So we really want something that can lie flatter than that, right? And we want something that can extend further in. Well, one thing we could do is just say, what if we just slid this thing over this way and counter slid the other part right back, right? and created a sprite card more like crosswise, right? What if we just did something like that? So rather than saying, look, for something like this, we're actually going to allow it to go down below this level. What if instead of doing that, we just took the alignment point and said, look, we have the camera. We know what we want is wherever the align is, we want to be able to shoot that line and hit the point that it's supposed to align with in view space, but we're going to leave it on the same Z plane that it was, right? So that gets slid forward. And then the one on the top, which would still be there, we want it to lie down flatter, so we're just gonna slide that backwards the other way. And by the way, if we wanna do it, we can compensate to keep the length the same, we can also slide it down, right? Meaning we can sort of treat it as a rotation. So slide forward till you hit the orientation, then lie down, right? Um, until you hit the orientation, I mean, until you hit the alignment point, right? So forward and, and down. Uh, you know, maybe that would get us out of the Z-bias business altogether. Uh, and again, I just don't know. I don't know what the right solution to this problem is. I'm not sure. Uh, but what I do think is true is we do kind of want to experiment a little more try to find something good uh, and that won't involve us doing a lot of fudge. You know, like I don't want a ton of fudge in there. Uh, now, I think that's what we want to do today and focus on today, see how far we can get. It'll probably take us uh, next weekend as well, right? So what I would like to do today uh, is I would like to go and first, I don't think we ever re-enabled our debug camera. Uh, so I think we should go get the debug camera working well uh, because that's, you know, the something that was just on the to-do list and we're going to need it to verify that we're lying down these things correctly. So let's go get our debug camera re-enabled. Um, and that'll probably be a significant chunk of what we do today because we want to make it decent. Uh, and then the other thing I want to do after we're done with that uh, is then play around something like this and maybe write that routine. So instead of using alignment points, uh, in a way that actually adjusts things in Z, never adjust in Z, adjust only in Y on the bottom. Uh, and then we'll, we will allow adjusting a Z in the top to maintain the height of things uh, in screen space, but that's all, right? Something along those lines. We'll see if that works. We'll see how far that gets us. Maybe it gets us all the way, in which case, party time. And we can just go uh, mark up all our art assets and call it a day. If that doesn't get us all the way, hopefully we will learn something that we can then use to determine what it is we should actually be doing um, to solve this problem because, hey, you know, that's, uh, that's the goal of exploratory programming. Either solve the problem or learn something that new uh, that allows us to solve the problem later. All right, so let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, oops. Here we are in Handmade Hero, and if uh, I run the game here, um, then what happens is, you know, here's me 
running the game. Uh, if I run the game, I switch to debug camera and I get, you know, kind of garbage, right? Uh, and the reason for this is the debug camera is still like nominally involved. Like you can see I'm actually able to look around actually, right? Um, but it's not, it's all screwed up. Uh, I think it doesn't have any displacement uh, from the hero. Uh, and it's just, it's right, it's, it's just, it's busted. You know what I mean? Um, so what I'd like to do is just re-enable that to the extent where we're able to, to easily get around the game with the debug camera so that when we come to a situation like say here, and we want to see what we have chosen for our sprite cards, we can do so easily. That's what I'd like to get uh, working, right? Um, so let's reacquaint ourselves with that particular piece of code. Uh, that's in the world mode right now, um, which is kind of the place where we actually, you know, world mode is, is game mode, right? It's the game where you're looking, the mode where you're looking at the world as opposed to say, uh, the opening cutscene or the title screen. Uh, we have a title screen now, did you know that? It's not really a title screen yet, but it's got a little thing on it. Um, so it's not just the cutscene. There is actually a little, uh, a little, um, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever you want to call that. There's a title screen. I think I might ask Anna to like uh, do that a little bit more uh, completely. Like the, um, I'd, I'd like to be able to make each of these things kind of like float independently. I don't know if she'd get grumpy if I asked for that, but I was kind of hoping. Um, anyway, so. Like what I'd like to do here is I'd like to go ahead and find uh, a good way of making the debug camera really useful, allow us to look around the world however we want, um, and and do you know kind of quick analyses of it and so on. So if you take a look at the way this code works in update and render worlds, what you can see here is we do look at the input. Uh, and you can see us updating the debug camera stuff still. So right, it's it's in there, right? Uh, but what you'll notice is that use debug camera is not even really predicated here. And we saw this problem before. We would have these situations where if I happen to move the mouse around without having switched to debug camera mode, it would actually change it around. And so one thing I would like to do is just right off the bat, I mean, I just remember not wanting this um, to be busted before uh, and just we never really fixed it. What I'd like to do is uh, let's, let's predicate this, right? Um, where we're not going to do any kind of weird stuff with the uh, debug mouse if you're not in debug camera mode, right? So if we're not using debug camera, it doesn't do anything. That's just better. Um, and that way, you know, we can kind of, and maybe I'll even do it this way. So it's until you actually affirmatively press, it doesn't change anything, right? And then if you have switched to debug camera mode, then you can do this other stuff, right? Then you can rotate around and you can zoom in and out and, and all that uh, good stuff, right? Um, so we'll start with that. So let's say you do switch to debug camera mode. What happens then? Uh, well, if you're in debug camera mode, then we have a couple different problems. Uh, we never actually fixed some of them. Uh, it, it, like, it, like we never really did the full debug camera, right? And so one of the problems uh, that we had was that we, you couldn't really move the debug camera, right? I mean, you look up here and we've got orbit, we've got pitch and we've got dolly. There's no pan, right? So you can't, you can't move the camera. You can only rotate the camera around and zoom it in and out, right? Which is fine for most things, but it would be all, it would be nice, right? To be able to like move, to actually take the camera and move it around the world as well, uh, because that's just a much, you know, easier uh, way to inspect things that we might want to inspect, right? So let's take a look uh, at, at that part as well. And in fact, you know, I can just put that on here. You, you can look, uh, we've got alt uh, left and alt middle um, are the ways that that's working. And so, you know, we need some way of uh, the debug camera, some, something that tells us that we're going to uh, pan. And so the thing that I think would be nice there is just look, if we just press the, like, let's say we did this. So basically what I'm saying here is, hey, if, if that middle mouse button goes down, then if the alt button is pressed, then we will rotate. But if it's not pressed, then we will pan, right? Okay. So the focus point can be moved here. And that's something that we can, you know, we can work on. 
Uh, so we'll put the pan code there when we're ready for it, uh, and we'll be good to go. So now if we come down here, we can see like near clip plane, far clip plane stuff. Uh, they're predicated on the debug camera. Uh, if you look at what's going on here, I don't love that. You know, I don't like the way this looks. Uh, and the reason is because it kind of intermixes those two pieces of code together in a way that's a little more than I would have liked, right? Uh, so what I'd rather do is I would rather have something that actually looks a little bit more like the code below where we say, hey, uh, if we are in use debug camera mode, then we will set these uh, to something else. Otherwise, they just appear as they appear above. That's just a little bit better. So let's set them to what they should be, which is these things. And then if we're using the debug camera, um, then I will go ahead and allow them to be set to these other things, right? And that way I can, again, see that this is the debug code here and this code is the actual code that we normally use. So it's more, uh, you know, uh, it's more direct, right? It's, it's something that you can see more clearly and you don't have to, uh, you don't have to sort of read these little inline ifs, which I like inline ifs quite a bit, but only for code that's actually always going to happen. If it's debug code, I'd rather keep it a little bit more separated so it's easier to see what's going on. So now when we come through here, what we're doing is using the camera pitch and orbit regardless. Uh, and that's intentional because again, uh, we've got that camera pit and pitch and orbit uh, setting that can change uh, in the actual game, potentially. Uh, and we want to set all that stuff up normally. So we're doing all of that here, as you can see. And then we set up the camera transform. Now, if we have a debug camera, then we want to set up our debug transform as well. And remember, we set these two up. There's a reason we set them both up. And the reason that we set up two separate camera transforms, one for the game, one for debug, and not just pick one and use it, is because there are things in the game that depend on the camera transform, such as how we lie our sprite cards down. When we switch to debug camera, we don't want them following the debug camera. We want them to stay oriented to the game camera so that we can pan around and look at our algorithms to see if they're working properly, right? So we need to keep, it's very important to have the concept in the render of two cameras. The one that we're actually viewing the world from, which is the like real rendering camera, and the one that we're yeah, I should say the game camera, the, the camera that would be used in the release mode build, which may not be where we're looking from right now, but is where all of the like camera facing stuff, all the culling code, all that stuff still needs to run off of that camera because that camera is the one we're trying to like use for debugging right now. Like the one that who's, we're trying to see if everything works with. And then the other one, is you know the debug camera the one that we're actually using for rendering that's the one that's actually displaying the world from right that's the one we're actually looking from so we want those two so that we can debug uh things that involve the camera because if we were always using our actual camera we'd rotate and we'd never be able to see how the sprites are working because they'd always turn to face us right uh and so that's it's just useful to understand why we need those two things and we do need them all right so when we go uh into use debug camera what you can see us doing here uh, is using some extra rotations that are applied to the camera uh, just for debug purposes, and that's fine. Uh, we then also have the debug camera dolly set here, and I think the problem that we're seeing uh, is the debug camera dolly is probably set to zero uh, at startup, and so what we're seeing is we're just we're dollied all the way in, and since dollying is itself based off of uh, the distance from the camera, uh, that creates an unrecoverable uh, situation. So what I'd like to do is over in this window here, I'd like to jump to where we're uh, initializing the world here. Uh, and you can see that happening, uh, I think right in, in the, where is it? Uh, no, 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 there it is. Uh, in here where we set things up, I would like to set that debug dolly, right? I'd like to set that to something like let's say 10, right? When I say I'd like to, what I mean is I'd like to do it temporarily just to show you that that was the, the case, but that we're going to do something else in a second. Um, but, you know, just, just bear with me here. So there we go. Uh, here, here's me building. Uh, and so if I right-click, 
now you can see that our debug camera is nominally restored, meaning we can now do the simple operations we were doing before, right? We'd like to go a little further than this, like I said, um, but you know, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. So why did I say I wanted to actually do something else there? Well, the reason is because it's a little jarring, right? I'm in here, I right click, and suddenly I'm in this situation, right? Um, and what I'd rather do is just be in this situation, probably, right? Um, so I'm wondering if what I can do is say, hey, uh, with this debug camera dolly, all this stuff, right? Um, would it be possible that just when you actually switch, so in here, we could say, look, uh, you know, if world mode use debug camera, so we know you're turning it on right now, could we set the, the camera dolly now to just be whatever the camera dolly actually is, right? So if you look in here, what you can see uh, is we are doing something, right? So when we come through here, we've got the camera orbit and the camera pitch, right? Uh, and then we've got this camera P and simulation center. We're setting the delta there, right? Then we do some work to set the spans. And then we come through here and we set the camera transform. And you can see us doing right here uh, our camera Z, you know, uh, and our camera zero T. These are uh, created to as part of our camera interpolation. Delta from sim, right, which is this right here, is the translation that tells us how far away we are from from the world, right? You can see us doing this subtraction here where simulation camera P. So that thing tells us where the camera actually is. It might be nice to set up our debug camera to follow that same position, right? To basically do that exact thing. Um, so we know here, for example, uh, that our camera zero T is setting us to some displacement uh, away from the camera. And you can see our camera orientation multiplying our dolly. That's the part that we're, uh, you know, this is the orientation part here uh, of the debug camera, or and this is that dolly that's setting us uh, away from it. It might be nice to figure out some way to, again, get those two things in line, right? Uh, and so if I look at what's going on here, you can see that when we take our camera orientation here, we really don't, we don't use that, right? Uh, how should I say this? Uh, we, we don't actually take our orientation, uh, the, ca the camera orientation, and modify this translation. So this part here, we don't actually, uh, in, in the actual game rendered camera, we don't, do anything to that translation. So it's just whatever the game said, here's where the camera's supposed to be, we just use that, right? And so if we were going to mimic the behavior of what that is here, we would need the camera dolly, right? <clears throat> to mimic the behavior of this. So the camera orbit and the camera pitch plus the camera dolly would have to reproduce whatever OT actually was going to be with Delta from Sim, right? I mean, that's what we would actually need. So if you take a look at what's going on here, you can see that we've got pretty much only debug camera stuff happening. Uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and say, what if we just move, uh, or, well, we don't even have to, we could do this. We could just record the fact that it's supposed to happen into a Boolean, right? And then what we can do is right down there where we were actually doing that piece of code, we could do the calculation. So in here where we say, look, we're about to do this uh, use debug camera. I'm gonna say, look, was I supposed to reset the debug camera here? If I was, maybe now what we do is we set the debug camera orbit. Uh, we set the debug camera pitch. And then we set the um, debug camera dolly and we try to get those to match, right? We try to get those things to match what the uh, camera displacement actually was. Now, in order to do that, we would actually need some inverse trig, uh, trig functions, right? We would need our ATAN2, um, but you know, maybe that's just fine because at some point we would like to use ATAN2 
Uh, and so we'll take a look at it, right? Okay. So let's go back to our drawing board here. Um, and let's just say, okay, here's the situation we actually have. We've got a rotation. Oh, that's not good. We've got a rotation like around a ring. Uh, and then we've got a rotation, and I should draw this better. Here's a plane. All right. So we've got a rotation, and the rotation is going to be this kind of a thing, right? It's going to go somewhere. Let's say it goes mostly around the horn to here, right? Then we do a rotation upward to here, right? So first rotation is that way, next rotation is this way, right? Uh, maybe I'll do a little bit smaller there, right? So this is orbit and this is pitch, I believe. I think that's orbit. This is pitch. And then we have a vector. Uh, and we know that we have a camera somewhere in space, right? So we're given this point. This is our camera point. And we want to know what is the orbit and the pitch that would be necessary to reproduce that. The distance is trivial, right? Because the distance from this point here, we're just going to know. That's not particularly difficult, right? Because it's just the length of that camera vector, right? So we trivially know this, right? That length, that's the dolly, and we trivially can get that piece of information. That shouldn't be a problem at all. What we don't know is how to reconstruct this vector from an orbit and a pitch, right? But it shouldn't be that hard to figure out because since the thing can only really rotate within this, right? It's the game camera, so it can really only rotate like that. We effectively know that the Z coordinate, right, of that vector, whatever that Z coordinate is, after we normalize it for length, its Z coordinate just tells us the pitch angle, right? I mean, how could it not? The only way this thing can get up into Z and not be flat in the plane is by having this angle, the angle, the pitch angle, be non-zero. If the pitch angle is zero, right, so there's no lift up, then we're not going to have any Z coordinate, right? So pitch of zero, that's not, right, of zero, <laughs> right, is Z of zero. These are the same. Right? And furthermore, a pitch of 1, right? I'm sorry, a z of 1, if we saw a z of 1, would mean that we pitched 90 degrees. Right? Right? Or tau over 4. What do you, how do you draw a tau again? You know, I'm so not used to drawing tau. Hold, please. It's like a little T looking thing. There it is. So it's like you kind of have to crook the thing and then the T kind of loops around. I don't like how much it looks like a regular T, but eh, it's close enough. I guess. That's not a very good tau, I apologize. Um, anyway, so a pitch that's going to be 90 degrees is going to be a z equal to 1, right? And so that pretty much tells us exactly what we wanted to know pretty much right off the bat. Uh, because it means that we can take the... Uh, uh, we know, right, how cosine and sine behave so we can immediately tell which way our circle is working here right? If the pitch is zero, meaning the angle is zero, z is zero. Is cosine of zero, zero? No, right? Cosine of zero is one. Is sine of zero, zero? Yes, right? So we know that the a sin, right, of uh, whatever this z value is, is going to give us our pitch. Another way of saying that is we know that tangent of an angle, right, whatever that angle is, we know the tangent angle is equal to sine over cosine. Oops. So if we want to do this all in terms of a tan 2, because that's probably the only a trig function we really want to have, 
We can pretty easily do that because since we know sine over cosine is what we would feed into a tan 2 to get our angle, well, we know that z is the sine, right? So whatever the other component of the vector is in that plane would be the cosine. You know what I'm saying? So we can trivially into our a tan 2, we can trivially say, look, just feed the z coordinate in after normalization of the vector. Just feed the z coordinate in as the sine value and whatever, the, uh, whatever is left over after removing the z coordinate, that length, so if you subtract that off of the z, zero out the z coordinate of the vector, that length is the bottom part, right, is the cosine. So the length of the, vec of the, of the remaining vector after z is gone, that would be the other one. So we could do it either of those uh, two ways, either with an asin or with an atan2. That would get us back the pitch value right? No worries. Uh, and then furthermore, if we wanted to figure out the rest of it, well, this vector that we would compute here, so after creating the planar version of this, so getting rid of the z, we're just looking at a vector, right? That vector is pointing in some direction. Hey, guess what? That vector itself has an xy coordinate. If we just feed that in to an atan2, that's going to give us how far around the circle the orbit we went, right? So again, really, really straightforward here. Uh, pretty much we're done. So we should be able to compute these things directly uh, without really too much trouble and reproduce the exact camera position for when we hit the right mouse button. Why do we care about doing this? We don't. It's just a good way to show you how to do those constructions. We try to do them a lot on Handmade Hero just to drill them in, right? Drill them in, drill them in, drill them in, right? So you know, don't be afraid of creating geometry. Don't be afraid uh, of trying to solve vector problems. Uh, do them over and over and over and over again. And I apologize, I kind of did that one quickly, but again, that's because we're on day five something, right? 520. You should be able to do that if you followed Handmade Hero so far. Uh, but you know, if, if you had trouble with it, we can go over it again in the Q&A. Uh, all right, so here we are needing to solve these. So like I said, uh, we've got an a tan 2 somewhere, right? Here it is. Um, and, uh, and these are our trig functions that we're going to replace someday, right? It's the only three uh, that we have. And someday we'll just write our own approximated versions and we'll be done with them, right? But we're allowed to use those three. So this we need an a tan 2 for. This I need an a tan 2 for. And the camera dolly part is actually quite easy. Like I said, that one comes right away. So let's see how to get those, okay? So we're sending the camera transform here and the camera transform is just this OT. So the dolly away from the focus point should just be the length of this vector in theory, right? So we should be able to get that camera dolly just by saying, okay, what's the length of that vector? That's the camera dolly, right? So at that point, once we have the length of that vector, we should then be able to produce uh, the normalized version. And I'm not going to be efficient here so because I, I don't care. Um, but if I want to do, in fact, I think, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so I'm going to normalize it. Like I said, I already have the length. So I'm just counting on the optimizer to do the right thing here. We don't care about this. this is not high performance part of the, of the thing right here. This is only getting called once. So it doesn't even matter what we do. But I now want the normalized camera arm, right? So I'm going to call this like, uh, well, I'll just call it cam arm for now. Uh, I want the normalized version of that, right? So this is the just a vector pointing. It's a unit vector pointing in the direction of the camera from the focus point, right? Uh, at least I believe that's what it is. It might be pointing the other direction if I'm totally wrong uh, about how this set camera transform works. I believe this is saying where the camera is. I could be wrong about that. Uh, looking at how we're doing it here, you can see us getting the columns of the camera orientation matrix and passing those down. That to me very much suggests that we are passing in the placement of the camera. I can verify that uh, by jumping to set camera transform and you can see in here what we're actually doing. So before we go any further, let's just verify that. Um, so camera P, here it is. Uh, we set the X, Y, Z camera P. Uh, directly so yeah it's just the position of the camera so it is it's so this is going from zero out to where the camera is so that's pretty much all there is to it right 
Uh, all right. So at that point, we now know this is where the camera is, and we know that we're looking at this particular point. Um, actually, no, I take that back. So this is actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, so yeah, we do need to do a little bit more work here. Uh, I lied to you. We're not moving just off of Z. We allow the camera to kind of like go side to side as well. So it actually doesn't have to be, you know, it's, it's going to be focusing on camera Z, straight down the camera Z um, axis. So actually, uh, what I said was a lie. We do need to create a... Uh, I'm not sure what I want to call this, but we need to create a cam uh, or like a two cam vector, right? And that is going to be uh, based off of this, but it has to only be the camera Z part of it, right? Now that's pretty easy for me to do. Uh, and the reason for that is of course, I can always measure anything against another vector that's a unit vector, right? I can take this and say, how far along the camera Z vector was I actually going? But in order to get the two cam back up for like the focus point, which is what I want to be able to revolve around, um, this actually has to happen. So I take it back. Uh, that was my bad, right? Now I'll draw that out for you really quickly just so you understand what I'm talking about. Um, but what I did is you saw me do the construction. I wanted to do the construction around the place the camera was looking at. But actually the camera displacement that we have isn't that kind of displacement, right? The actual displacement we have is saying here's zero zero in the world. The camera displacement is like over here or you know somewhere up in space like over here. And then its z vector is whatever else we want it to be. So the z vector is actually just pointing down to here or something. So that's what it's actually looking at is something over here. Now if I want to know what point it's looking at, well it's still looking at the point zero 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 in a sense, just translated over, right? So if I take the camera Z axis and I take the inner product of this vector with it, I will get how far along the Z vector we actually went, right? So all I'm doing is removing the other components and just saying, look, let's look only at those. So this is the actual displacement of the camera uh, in the world only off of its Z axis, right? Only off of its Z axis. So that is more uh, useful to us. And then we can construct the thing which we actually want in that case, um, which I can construct off of, uh, off of this by saying, look, when we actually do this, we need to retain the displacement that we were going to get before. Uh, like we need that, we need a camera placement vector that we're going to use. Uh, and that will be whatever the residual is here, right? Um, so I can show you what we would do with that as well. Let's do that part. Uh, and this would give us a, a good way to do the, the panning as well. Because like I said, we need to do the panning. So we need something on here that's like a camera pan. And that camera pan is something that allows us to move the camera around, which we couldn't do before, in addition to just orbiting it and stuff like that. So what we want to do here is say, okay, the world mode camera pan is whatever the displacement was that isn't part of the camera dolly. So once we have this two cam vector, we know what that is again, because we just say, look, whatever the total displacement was that we have, get rid of the part that's gonna be our dolly part and just tell me what's left. That's the panning amount, right? Then we proceed as normal. So now we say, look, how long is the part that actually goes back to the camera? Great, that's the camera debug dolly part, right? And really, you know, at this part, we could be a little bit squinkier and say, oh, hey, well, by the way, Instead of constructing it and then retaking the length, how about we just say, give me the length directly, because I know it, right? Because that's what that is right there. That's the length that we have to go along Z to get to where the camera is, right? You know, that was it. So we can actually get rid of that length call now too, because we can just say, oh, well, this is what we actually needed to do there, where we just said, there's the debug camera dolly, and, and we take the... 
uh, the camera Z there to create the two cam vector. That means we no longer need that uh, vector to be normalized either because it means that uh, the camera Z vector is actually our camera arm now, right? So that Z vector, whatever the camera Z vector is, that's the camera arm, right? We don't need to normalize anything because we've got it all now. At least I think we do. So now we have all of the information that we need and we just need to do some a tan -tuing. Uh, so like I said, in here we have one more projection step we would like to do, which is we'd like to get the Z out of there, right? So what we want to do is say, hey, there's a, there's a planar, right, version of this that doesn't have the Z. It's just cam arm X, cam arm Y, right? So that's the part that's, n that's in a plane in Z, right, that doesn't lift up. And off we go. Right? So if we know all of those pieces of information, we should be able to do our A tan twos pretty easily now, right? So the first one we just need to know is that length, right? So the length of the camera, I don't even really need to do it there because I'm only gonna use it once. So what I can do is say, look, whatever the length of the planar arm is, that's our X. Uh, we know our Y for the A tan two, it's just the camera Z's Z value. That gives us whatever, oops, in the wrong one here. That gives us whatever the pitch is. And in the planar version, that planar arm is actually exactly the thing that we would take to get our orbit, because it's the thing inside, uh, right, inside the, um, the circle. So now all we have to do is make sure these things line up with what we were actually using. You can see we don't do any displacement here and we don't do any displacement here. So I think that should give us basically what we wanted, right? Um, I think. And then what we need to do is say, okay, we don't use this anymore. This is not a thing that we actually do uh, directly. Instead, what we want to do is take that pan and base that OT off of it, right? So that way we start in, a, in the place that we're saying we're focusing on, and then we do our rotation uh, of the dolly vector around there, right? Now things get a little bit more complicated because what will happen if you actually run this code, even if I didn't make any math mistakes, even if I didn't make any math mistakes, is we will not get the correct result. It'll be close, but it'll be mirrored and flipped, right? And what's the reason for that? Well, the reason for that is think about how ATAN2 actually works. ATAN2 works specifically assuming that the vector you started with was pointing along the x direction, right? And just again, to like hammer this home. Suppose I was to draw the unit circle, right? I take a tan two of this vector, right? Here's my x equals one, right? X equals one, negative one y, negative one x, positive one y, right? You guys know what I'm talking about here? So if I'm looking at the circle, the unit circle here, if I take the a tan two of this vector, what do I get? I get zero, right? So a tan two, you know, let me just draw it out. I should say write it out. So if I take the a tan two of coordinates, uh, right, this is one comma zero in x, y, right? Y goes on the top, x goes on the bottom, right? a tan two sine over cosine, y over x. So if I take the a tan two of this, what do I get? Well, I get zero degrees, right? I'm gonna get zero. If I take the a tan two of this, what do I get, right? So that's gonna be one over zero, right? So what do I get in that case? Uh, well, I guess besides the fact that this would normally multiply out to, this would actually divide out to nothing, but that's why we use a tan two, because you never do that actual divide, right? I mean, that tells you right there why I do it, because I want to be able to get back to the 9 degrees. So if we feed that into a tan 2, right, what am I going to get? Well, I'm going to get 90, right? And keep going, right? What's going to be here? I'm going to get pi, going to get uh, 3 pi over 4, right? Blah, 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 blah. So what you can see there is it's giving me the answer for rotation, assuming that the vector I started rotating was a 1, 0 vector right? It was a vector that started here. 
If my vector didn't start there, that's not the answer I'm going to get. Right? So let's see what we've got here. If you look at what we start with, it ain't that vector. Right? That's not the x direction in any coordinate space. Right? So I could probably, and I think maybe we should just try this, I could start with one that just goes down the x direction, and then it would probably work. Right? But these might be weird now, so these would have to be changed. Uh, so the thing that rotates, um, if I started in the plane, and then I rotated, and then I pitched, uh, right, the way that I would have to do that is, is I'd have to orbit first, and then pitch second, so the pitch vector would have to actually be, yeah, um, if I pitch first, well, you know what, I think that still probably works. All right, so I think the only real thing we have to change is this X rotation, right? So if we're pointing down the X axis and we want to pitch up, then what we need to do is rotate around the Y axis, right? Because if the X axis needs to pitch upward, the thing that's perpendicular to it that would pitch it upward is the Y. X will rotate it around, and that, I'm sorry, Z will rotate it around, which is what we're doing here, and Y will pitch it up. So now we're starting in the place we're actually measuring. So now, now we should have a correct construction. Of course, there's way too much math there. You never get it right the first time. So uh, we won't, but at least we now don't have any uh, obvious mistakes, right? Uh, that we can fix ahead of time. Okay, so what's going on here? Oh, debug camera dog. This is supposed to be an inner product. That's my bad. Uh, just trying to write it in math notation there, like as if there was a dot operator or something, right? This is an inner product, right? We just want to measure how far along Z we displace ourselves there. Um, let's see what that is. This is supposed to be a V2 to construct. Uh, and off we go. Now, the other thing we could do here, uh, we could actually say this, now that I think about it, um, I think we support this. Uh, so there we go. All right. Uh, now again, I don't actually think this is going to work because I think we've got too much stuff going on here, right? Uh, what just happened? That's weird. What did we do wrong there? Was that a reload problem? What was going on there? No. That must have just been a bug in our loading code or something? I didn't actually mean to kill that. I wanted to look at that bug. Um, I'm not sure why that would fail other than like a bitmap info just being null. Probably. Uh, so that probably was a bitmap info equal null. I would have liked to have I'm, I'm bummed that I didn't get it to look at that. Um, all right, well, that's unfortunate. Um, all right, uh, so anyway, you can see that it is wrong, right? Exactly like I said it would be. Uh, so now we gotta go do our, our homework and see what the problem is. Although I, th I do wonder if the only problem is just we're pointing the wrong direction. Um, hold on, let me take a look at this uh, construction that we ended up with here uh, one more time. So if I go in here and look at what we did for construction, uh, the camera Z is pointing backwards, right? So this is measuring how far back from the place we're focusing on we would go, right? So that, that inner product there uh, is, is measuring that off of the origin. Um, so I think that should be correct. We'll have to think it through a little bit carefully and obviously debug code, uh, but that's fine. So then we have the vector to the camera. The vector to the camera should be whatever that was times the camera Z. That should be the displacement in Z. Uh, that seems correct as well. And then the panning that we actually want is gonna be whatever is necessary to, assuming that the two cam 
is actually getting reconstructed, we want the rest of it, which is this, right, to, to still be added in. Uh, and that is what we should do. That is what should work right there. Uh, we then have the camera arm. That's going to be, uh, that's not right. I said it was supposed to be two cam, and for some reason it wasn't. Uh, so two cam is actually the camera arm. So I'm, I'm not sure why I did that. Uh, this is actually the thing that we want. Um, so this is the, all of this is wrong. I, I just this was just a typo festival. I don't know why uh, I seem to have had such a problem with it. Um, yeah. So so this is the camera. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is two camera. Oh no 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 no! I'm sorry. I'm, uh, that's not that's not true. That's not true. Uh, I I do agree with that, right? The camera arm is just camera Z because we want it normalized now, right? So this is the unit vector that we are talking about. So no no no! I, I'm I'm I I totally totally wrong. I didn't mean to to uh, malign our code like that. That was just a brain fart. So yes, that's correct. The planar arm is the XY com component of that, so it doesn't include the Z displacement that goes um, upward, right, out of the plane. So then we can take a look here. We say, what's the debug camera orbit? Well, it's the uh, planar arm Y over the planar arm X. That should give us the spin uh, around in there. Um, ah, that's not normalized. This needs to be... No, it shouldn't be normalized, actually, because ATAN2 will automatically take care of that. So we don't need normalization, that's fine too. Uh, then we got debug camera pitch, and that's just the Z value uh, is the sine part. Yep, that's correct. And then however long the planar arm was, that's the other part of the, that's the other X component of it. Um, that seems correct as well. I don't see any real issue there. Um, yeah, that all, that all seems relatively good to me. So what I'd like to do now is debug that. Uh, and before I do, I'm just going to set us set ourselves up for a slightly better, um, so something a little bit easier to work with than what we've got here. What I'm going to do is, uh, set another thing here. That's like the camera arm, uh, recomputation. So here's us re you know, recreating that camera arm effectively. I mean, here's actually the camera arm. So this is us recreating the two cam, right? So I'm going to go ahead and grab that part here. So we can look at this separately. So we can look at the two cam uh, as well as, you know, it getting reconstructed with the camera pan. And so what we should be able to do ideally is look at these things coming in here. Now, debug uh, the zero T and the O here. So, so these actually exist up here, and, and that makes it less good uh, because I want to maybe be able to look at uh, those both at the same time. So what I'd like to do is just uh, expand this out uh, to use like a debug version of each naming convention-wise. Um, so I can kind of do something more like this, where we've just got, you know, debug versions of them that are computed separately. Uh, and then each of these, uh, you know, can be, can be recomputed. Right, so that looks that looks right. So we can compute uh, debug camera O. Use that here to get OT, and then we use debug camera O and OT all throughout here. So that should let me now, if I uh, go through and do a debug build. Uh, so let me go to the build.bat and, and change that into a debug build. Uh, if I take the debug build and step through it now, I w would like to be able to look at where we're maybe getting these uh, values wrong. Uh, and see if we can't debug, uh, like I said, you know, I said I wouldn't get it right the first time and I wasn't wrong. Uh, that's one of the times where you'd like to be wrong. You'd like to be like, oh, ha ha, I, was, I guess I did get it right. Uh, not so. All right, so anyway, inside here, uh, here's us looking uh, pretty standard, uh, looking at the world. The orbit should be zero probably at this point because I think the center of the simulation is probably roughly where we're looking at. I don't really know if that's true, um, but let's take a look. So I right click and we got uh, the first step of our solve here. So let's take a look at what these values actually uh, are. So here's camera zero T. Uh, what? Oh, sorry, camera OT. <laughs> Can't read the difference between the zero and the O. Uh, and here's camera Z. 
So as we expect, because there's no orbit, the x component of our uh, camera z is zero. That's exactly what we want to see. Uh, and then we have our other components here for y and z. You know, it's up a little bit and it's back because like the y goes upwards, right? So this, this is what we would expect. That all looks reasonable. Uh, if we look here, our x component of our camera uh, orientation, I'm sorry, our camera's oriented translation, so the displacement of the camera, um, which, by the way, I don't know why it's called that, because it's not that out here, so that's a little bit weird, but doesn't matter. Um, the x component of that's also zero, and that's good. Um, and you can see that it's got a displacement that is exactly what we would probably expect it to be, so that's all fine. And so now what we'd like to do is go, all right, let's step through and see what we get. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute some of these world mode values here. Um, since the world mode structure is pretty big, I'm just going to get the ones we actually want. So here's uh, debug camera dolly. Why I didn't call this debug camera pan, I don't know. Uh, we should have changed that. So, you know, in here, uh, this should actually not be what it is. Uh, this should be up here and it should be called debug camera pan. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So like, yeah, in here where we were doing camera pan, it should be debug camera pan um, in both of these places. And that was just a screw up on our part. Okay. Uh, so coming back here, you can see us doing um, the inner product to get the debug camera dolly. So that value right here should be somewhat close to whatever the distance should be uh, of this. And you know, that looks uh, reasonable. You know, that looks like uh, not a totally uh, ridiculous idea. Right, uh, and so if I was to look at what was going on there, uh, you know, is this is it, are those values uh, actually commensurate? Uh, so it's like negative five times negative five, right? Um, which is just twenty-five uh, plus twelve times twelve, right? So it's like one sixty-nine, uh, and hey, that's exactly thirteen. Yeah, so you know, this is exactly the value that we thought. You know, so I just, I just did the Pythagorean theorem there, right? Like you know. Uh, this square rooted is 13, so off you go. Uh, so, you know, looking at this, I just go, yeah, okay, that's a pretty reasonable camera dolly amount because that's exactly what it would take to put us back at this camera OT. So, so far, so good. That doesn't look like much of a mistake. That looks pretty good. Um, so let's take a look at the two cam vector. Uh, our two cam vector should now basically be this, and it is, which is exactly what we want, right? So now we need to get that residual into camera pan, it should basically be zero, right? So we should basically have a zero uh, displacement because we're looking right at the target. We're, we're not displaced from zero, zero. We're looking right at zero, zero. Um, so we should get basically nothing and that's exactly what we get. You can see the residual is the same as here. That's exactly what we expect. Very, very tiny number. So that's all looks totally right. Uh, so now let's take that camera arm. The camera arm is just Z, right? So you can see it, that's what that is. Uh, and the planar arm uh, is, is just the XY component of that. So now we need to do our ATAN2 uh, and we need to compute our camera orbit and camera pitch. So our first ATAN2 is say, hey, let's take the X and the Y, just that planar portion. How, you know, what's the rotation around of that thing? Uh, let's get that in here. All right. Uh, and then we'll also compute what that pitch upward was, right? And so you can see us getting some values uh, that, I guess for orbit's sake, seems about right. It's trying to rotate us uh, 90 degrees this way. That is exactly what we would need to rotate to put ourselves into negative Y facing, which is exactly where we are. Uh, pitch wise, it's telling us we need to rotate negative uh, 1.57. That's again, that's a that's around a half pi, right? Uh, 3.14, so it's a little more than that, uh, which is you know, it's gonna be a little bit, um, that seems a little bit odd to me. So the x, y one seemed about right. Because if you were going to try and rotate, you'd need to rotate the X thing down to be here. But rotating it to rotate this 
this part uh, in order to go upward around the y-axis. No, I guess that's right too, because it would be negative to flip it up. So those both seem relatively plausible. The only thing I would say is <clears throat> is nothing that those both look good so that's negative the debug camera pitch this is the part i'm saying uh that actually seems like that is going in the wrong direction i, I really do think so though because if you apply the right hand rule to the y-axis right it's going to pitch you down uh so i think i actually didn't do the winding properly there so although this is not the bug we're seeing, this is a different bug, uh, the winding is wrong on our pitch. And here's why the winding is wrong. So if you imagine looking at the X, Y, Z, and I wish I could, and I can't really show you my hands very well uh, on the stream, but if you imagine doing the right hand rule, so you curl your right hand around the Y axis. Well, the Z axis is actually the X and the y-axis, uh, the x-axis is actually the y, right? So in here, <clears throat> when we did debug camera pitch, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this would actually be assuming that the, the vector started up on the, like it, these are inverted, right? It's assuming that the z was actually the y, but it's not, right? Um, so the winding on this is in fact wrong and I'm not sure exactly what I want to do there to fix that. Because there's a lot of ways I could do it, right? I could negate the Z, for example. Uh, but if you think about how this is starting out, so this is totally fine because it's going to rotate whatever vector we end up with. It's going to rotate it around Z, and that's totally exactly the same thing that we're measuring here. But this Y rotation, right, this Y rotation um, is the first thing that gets applied. So it's going to apply to an X. It's going to apply a Y rotation. If you look at the XY plane formed by the Y axis, it's actually Z is, is the X axis and Y is the Y axis. So I'm just trying to think about how I want to measure that part of it. It's like, you know, do I want to invert the winding or do I want to keep the winding the same? I guess I want to say, let's keep the winding the same. So what that means is that the, uh, for the pitch, since the Z axis is actually the X, it goes on the bottom. And since the the actual uh, length in the uh, how big that vector would have been when it was on the x axis, uh, that's actually going to be the length of the planar arm. I think this is more what we're actually looking for here, right? Uh, and we do have a problem, which is the length of the planar arm is not signed and so we would like it to have been signed so when it crosses over it should so if the z right came over the top and back around again which we don't actually do in the game so this is never going to cause an actual problem but if we were actually viewing it from the up the back side looking back down so we flipped over and we're looking like that uh this would be the incorrect sign right because we're just taking the length of it we don't track the fact that it had flipped it gone over here uh so we could try to do something more fancy there right but i don't think we need to uh, but anyway so i just let's fix that first uh and let's try this again all right so there's the debug camera dolly 
uh, there's the camera pan, orbit, and pitch. So now uh, let's take a look. We've got the Diva camera orbit, the pitch. Uh, with the X, oh, <sighs> crap. And it's, again, it's also, it's inverted. Because if it started here and rotated down, yeah, so. So I guess, again, still not really following my own rules. So we would have to start with the vector we had before, right? We would have to start with Z pointing upwards, uh, and then, again, we can make that be correct. So I guess what we had originally was actually not so bad. If this is an X rotation, that would be okay, because X would be fine. X would be rotating from the Z over to the negative Y, right? And so if you just put that in here and this was always gonna be negative, this would basically preserve the old way we were doing it, right? Because we did an X rotation, not a Y rotation, if I remember correctly. So that actually would be fine for the way we were doing it. And maybe I should have done that to not change it. Uh, all right, so let's see what we get here. All right. Um, so let's see, with the orbit being what it is, and then this being a negative pitch, so if I have uh, the x-axis and I'm looking at these, I guess I can just choose whether I negate this or not to whether I want the pitch to be negative or not. Um, since the x rotation will rotate towards the uh, right hand rule wise, will rotate y into x, then we're always going to sort of have it, yeah, it's always going to be 90 degrees off, right? So the 90 degrees off would also, would have also flipped that because we're not starting at the y-axis either. This is a bit of a mind bender. I probably should draw this out again just to make sure we get that correct. Because there's way too many things in there that's like, okay, negative flipped, like either one could happen. Uh, so anyway, yeah, let's see. So the length of the planar arm, uh, if that's a positive pitch, that should go, yeah, that's what we would expect to see. Uh, so let's now, we have to debug the rest of it because uh, we're still a little bit janky here. So hold on a second. Uh, all right. So now if we hit the right mouse button, what do we get? So we're almost right, but we're We've got our orbit wrong, it looks like. Um, and you know, again, that's just a, a case of me failing to do this as, as meticulously as I should. Because if you think about it too here, the problem we're gonna have is that this is producing something after pitching that, uh, again, is not in the x-axis, right? Um, so let's adjust this debug camera orbit to assume that what we're doing is we're starting uh, along the z-axis. So we take the z-axis and we're folding it down. So now it's pointing along negative y, right, uh, instead of x, which means it's going to be uh, 90 degrees back from where it should be, right? It's, it's just 90 degrees. It's it's going to have to rotate an extra 90 degrees from where it, this would return it was, right? So you'd imagine, that, right? Uh, would give us the actual orbit that we wanted because we need to do an extra 90 to get from where we thought we were to where we actually are, right? Um, we could also, because of trigonometric identities, uh, we could, actually fix that part too, um, but we'll get to that in a second. All right, so uh, what have we learned? 
other than the fact that I need to be more meticulous about where I'm conceiving my ATAN 2s to have started from. Uh, that was relatively painless though. And now we do have it working exactly as we want. So now uh, if I hit the right click, I'm in debug mode. It puts me exactly where we are, right? This is the game, this is debug mode, right? So we've solved for exactly where we should be. Now, I don't know how we want our rotation to work. Right now it works, it looks like the left right rotation is not what I want it to be. So I want the, I don't know, I thought we addressed this before. Um, but you can see that that's going the wrong way. So I'm just gonna change the way the input is and make it be a trackball-y kind of a thing for now, I think. Um, so let's say I do that. There we go. And so now if I run it, uh, what you can see is uh, I have a trackball version, right? And I can zoom in and off we go, right? If I go back to the debug, let's see if I can make it work here. Look at that, perfect, right? So we got the math just right. Uh, my ATAN 2 was too sloppy, so we didn't quite get it first try. But otherwise, we, we got the construction basically right first try. It's just we, we were too sloppy about our, our ATAN 2 origins, right? Um, so there's virtual uh, trackball -y sort of version of it, right? Uh, and we can go in here. So now what we need to do is we need to get our pan. We need to get panning in there, right? And so what we'd like to do for panning is we'd like to take the world mode uh, debug camera pan and we'd like to add something to it, right? And we've got two things we can add to it. We've got dmouse px and dmouse py, right? But we don't know what we would actually add there. So, you know, think about this for a second. Suppose I want to add something to this, uh, what do I add? Like, what do I actually do to make this work, right? So the naive thing would be, well, I don't know, like maybe I take, you know, the, the pan amount that we're doing here, and I just say, well, you know, I've got an X and a Y, so there's the D mouse PX and the D mouse uh, PY, and, and we'll, you know, we'll just we'll add those in, right? That's kind of the amateur hour way to do it, right? Uh, and what ends up happening if I do that is when I go into this mode, I can pan, right? And, you know, all right, it's it's kind of counterintuitive because the axes are not aligned uh, the way that you would think that they would be, right? Um, so it's, it's a little bit weird, but you might think it's fine. Uh, and so maybe you just do something like this, right? You know, I invert these two. Again, just showing you kind of what people often do and is crappy, um, you know, like just to give you some perspective. So I go into debug mode and I, I say, all right, let's 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 move it around. And now it seems like it's working pretty good, right? Like, okay, that's, that's great, you know? Um, now I can kind of pan the camera around and maybe I need it to be a little bit faster than that or something. Um, and so maybe I can do something about that, but for the moment it seems fine, right? But it's not fine because what actually happens is when we actually go in here and, and, and change uh, the orientation of the camera, like let's say here, now when we go to pan, it's totally whack, right? Because it's just using the world coordinate space, right? So it's just, it's totally busted. I've actually played like bad Unity games that have stuff like this in them that the actual player has to deal with, right? And stuff like this. Um, anyway, sort of separate issue. But uh, anyway, so the question is, what do we actually need to use here to make us move in the space of the, that the camera is looking at? Like, how do we do that, right? Well, we know what the camera's x, y coordinate, uh, x, y axes are because those are actually told to us in the world mode, right? We actually know what those what those are. We compute them, uh, right, and store them right here, right? These these get columns. This is the x axis of the camera. This is the y axis of the camera, and this is the z axis of the camera. So if we want to, again, and I was sort of like I didn't know if I wanted to move this down there or not, but I, you know. At this point, now it's pretty clear. I want those computations. So what I'm gonna do is put that right here effectively, right? So I'm gonna put that in here where we adjust the debug stuff. That'll be adjusted right here. And so what I'm gonna do is just use those things that we actually created. Now I can do that pretty easily by actually just making these be things that we get 
uh, out earlier, right? So now we have the camera X, Y, Z. And then down where I actually use them, I'll just actually use camera X, camera Y, uh, camera Z. But think about it. So now if I know for the camera's frame of reference, you know, what it's looking at the world through, if I know what X axis it thinks it's looking at and what Y axis it thinks it's looking at, that's the screen, right? So if I just multiply the X motion here, right, by the camera's X axis, and I multiply the Y, and again, I want to invert this because I believe the mouse, well, actually, I don't know which direction our mouse goes. I'm, I'll leave it this way because I don't really remember which, which way we had the mouse coordinates come in. Sorry, I just don't, right? Now I've created an XY space that actually matches what the camera's actually seeing. And that's step one to getting our pan to work right. So let me show you what that looks like, right? Uh, here's that pan, right? And it looks like, yeah, so, so that's perfect, right? It's counter what we want, but that's actually what we would expect. And the reason for that is this is a displacement of the camera. So it's actually the opposite displacement. It's moving the camera in that uh, di direction, right? So I believe that is actually what we expect. Although, uh, does that mean our Y is flipped? Let me see, do we flip the Y? What is that? That's mouse clip space, mouse P. So that's, a, oh yeah, we do. There it is. I'm like, that doesn't really make sense. I'm like, we should have had to clip the, we should have, to, should have had to have inverted the Y for that to be correct. But okay, we did, so that's fine, right? Uh, all right, so since again, this is a displacement of the camera, I'm trying to think if that makes sense or not. Because it's a little weird that it was, I would have expected to move exactly along. Nope, that's correct. So here's why this is correct. Uh, if we're moving, if I move the ca if I move the mouse this way, the camera should move along its x-axis. That's a negative x motion with the mouse. That means it should be a negative x motion, which is this direction, right? And that's exactly what I see. I happen to want the semantics to be like grab and pull the screen around, you know? So that's where the negation comes in. So we're all good, right? Okay. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to say, all right, I'd like this to also be proportional to the dolly. Because as we're closer in, I want to move less. And when we're further away, I want to move more, right? So what I'd like to do is the same thing I did with zoom speed here, which is to say that pan speed should be proportional to this. And so we'll just do pan speed times the dolly, right? And just to let you know why, if I don't recompile, so we do the old version, uh, I can show you what that means. So here's me panning around, right? And now if I zoom in, you can see that I pan way more when I'm in, and if I'm way out, I pan almost not at all, right? That's just not what we want. We want to pan proportional to what we're seeing so that it feels more like we're moving uh, the thing uniformly regardless of how far zoomed in we are, right? Um, so now if I do this, you can see it moves a lot out here. If I zoom in, it moves significantly less, right? Uh, proportionally. Still way too fast. So I think what we want to do is maybe knock that down a bit. Again, we can just tune this to our own personal preference about how fast we want the camera to pan. Uh, there's no right answer there. Uh, so we can just say, all right, let's say we're out here. Um, still looks a little too fast for my taste. I'm gonna go with an 0.5 maybe. Um, don't ask me why this was multiplied on the other side. I tend to put scalars on the left. Um, I don't know why I didn't hear. Uh, on scalars on the left of variables. Uh, so that seems fine, right? Uh, no concerns there, pretty happy with that. Yeah. 
Uh, so one of the things that's weird is, yeah, for the picking, um, you'll note that picking only is activated, uh, or the drawing anyway of the picking is only activated when we're in the edit mode. We probably want this to be active all the time because I'd like to also have a thing where we can focus on a particular part, right? Uh, but anyway, it's totally fine. Uh, so we're in good shape now. Uh, and I can always zoop back to where I am. And so now we should be able to really use the camera for what we were intentionally, uh, what we we're going to do it, uh, int intending to do it with it, which is like, you know, when we're in some situation, we can now right click uh, and actually inspect really what's going on in 3D much more cleanly than we were able to do so before. And so very specifically what we want to be able to do at this point is we'd like to be able to now start addressing these kind of errors. Like I said, uh, we got to get this fixed so that we can use uh, more effectively our sprite cards in a way that inserts them into the environment well. Uh, and again, I'm just thinking to myself, uh, uh, you know, I would, I would like to, to, uh, I would like to try that method of doing a Y displacement and actually not having any Z bias in there at all, just to see whether that magically ends up uh, giving us what we want. I don't know if it will, it probably won't, uh, but that's at least something we can try uh, to see whether that gets us closer to uh, acceptable. I will say too, like, man, I'm really liking the look. Like, It's just, I think we've got a little bit more to do on our lighting and then the, this fixture sprite cards. It's really looking nice. Uh, like, I'm really liking the aesthetics now. Um, and that's really important to me. Um, again, I'm an engine programmer, not a game designer. Don't care about the game design. It's not my thing. Um, but the aesthetics is important, right? That's part of my job as engine programmer is to make the engine, make the art look good, right? Um, Nobody likes an engine programmer who makes crappy systems that make the art look lousy, right? That's no good. Uh, you need to understand how your programming affects the aesthetics of the things on the screen. And like, I really try to like show you how to dig into things like that. All right, I don't know how much time I have. I think I've got 15 minutes maybe left. Uh, so. The thing that I said about sprites, uh, figuring out the alignment of them, I figure that's not actually that hard for us to do uh, to start with. So let's just play around with it a little bit. Um, and uh, there's a couple things that are involved with it that are a little harder to do. We can skip those for starters. But just in the next 15 minutes, I should be able to do a little bit uh, of that sprite adjustment, right? So let's start down that path. Uh, again, that's in the entity code, um, which is where we draw all of our sprites. You can see that happening in here. Uh, so as we come through this piece of code, you can see us grabbing a texture handle. Uh, this is just to highlight. So this is not, this part is not important. This is our alignment point code. So we're only really talking about this part here. Uh, and what you can see uh, us doing in here is we've got this push sprite call happening and the sprite values for upright uh, are, are coming in there. So really the sprite values for upright uh, is the part that we actually care about. Uh, this align P is the part that's telling us how it's supposed to be aligned with the point that's com that's being input, right? Um, so yeah, so let's do the hacked version first. So what you can see happening here, and I'm gonna walk you through this step by step. We're not gonna do this. What I'm about to do is not gonna be the final answer. Next weekend, we'll do that. Right now, we're just gonna play with this a little bit to get some information about whether it's plausible for us. Okay. So what you can see happening here is we start by saying, what's the up vector of the world? And the up vector of the world is just the z-axis, right? What's the up vector of the camera? And that's totally dependent on the camera pitch, right? Whatever the pitch of the camera is, that's what it is, so, right? Then we have the x and y axes. Uh, and we know that the x-axis is just going to be 
the camera doesn't rotate in our game, right? So the x-axis is always just the camera's x. The y-axis, on the other hand, is something we're going to... So that's what sticks the card up straight. We're saying we're going to use an interpolation parameter that you can specify, and we're going to use that interpolation parameter to kind of like fold, like we're going to sort of fold it down a little bit, right? So that's, again, what gives us that, uh, that lean down effect. Then we compute this z bias. Um, I don't care about that at the moment because we're just not using it, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this out for now, right? And I'm pretty sure that I can. Um, I don't think we use that anywhere. I think we're setting the z bias to zero right now, uh, and then you can see it's just it's just not a problem, right? It's just it's drawing the same stuff it was before. Uh, which is what we expect. So that's good. So uh, we then come down and say, let's reduce the x, actual x and y axes. You can see us multiplying out the dimensions here. And then you can see us producing this base point. We're using the alignment x um, to align along the x axis. That won't cause any differentiation. This is the one that will, using the align y to go along the, uh, the, the y axis. So what I'm proposing, right, is that we don't do that. Um, what I'm proposing we do is use the world y-axis, right? Now, I don't know if we have that in the render group. I'm going to jump over to the render group here uh, and just see if we got it. So we don't actually have that, um, but that's okay for now. I'm just going to say, look, we know it's the z-axis. I'm sorry, we know it's the y-axis right now. So to move the align y along the y-axis temporarily, and we'll add that in uh, to, the, to our render group if that turns out to be what we actually use so that you can adjust it as necessary. Now, that Y axis, right, is pointing the other direction. So the align PY is telling us how, like, uh, far we would need to move to, like, we're doing a subtract there, I guess is what I'm saying. So I'm, I guess if I think about how we would uh, position that, it means that the minimum position we need to go backwards along x this far and backwards along y that far, so that's how far in it is. That means uh, we would need to displace along negative y, if I'm not mistaken, meaning towards the camera, to make that adjustment, right? Uh, and so that should displace things inward, uh, I would think. Right, and I'm not 100% sure about that, so we'll see. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start playing with this and uh, see where we can get. Again, we're just just playing around because we don't have much time left in the episode, so I'm not gonna do anything too fancy. So if I go to alignment points here, and, and I'm gonna uh, uh, adjust the alignment of like this thing. So I'm gonna move this uh, so that its default alignment is like 50/50, right? And that looks like it's moving it the wrong direction, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, that's moving it forward, which I don't think is what I wanted. Now, the other problem I have is the distance of this is also wrong because this doesn't, this world dim isn't being respected here. Uh, so I'm also gonna, I'm gonna throw in the world dim Y to correct for that. So I'm gonna say uh, that that's in here, let's say. All right. Um, I don't want this head in the way at the immediate moment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off the alignment point uh, for that. So I'm gonna say, look, get the head out of there, right? Uh, and I'm gonna go back to the game camera. So here we are in the game camera, blow that out to full screen. This is our, our little dude, uh, right? Hop along. Uh, and looking at where that sprite is, let's see if this alignment now makes sense, right? And it sure does look like it, it kind of makes sense, right? So if we put it right in the middle, which is where we, that's where we would kind of expect that sprite to stick, roughly. Uh, and then I adjust the top of head part. Uh, well, is that, is that right? I think that's about right. I adjust the top of head part to be like right where I think that should be. I'll turn it back to base of neck. And then I adjust the hero head 
to have an alignment point, some default alignment point, uh, that goes to the parent, right? Yeah. Um, and so then I adjust it so it's on the head roughly. And I don't know if these sizes uh, are what they should be. You know, I don't know what the size of the head should be, really. Um, but we can play with that stuff later. So let's suppose I get all that in there. And I'm like, all right, that seems about right. All right, so now what happens? Well, I'm gonna hop along, right? So it looks like we get a little bit of interpenetration on this hop, but I think that's actually because the hop is wrong. The hop should really be higher and and like here's us looking at the hop the hop doesn't actually hop up in z like it should it's actually hopping in y which is wrong so the hop is actually just wrong but that sorting sure looks good right that sorting looks real good to me i don't know about how you folks feel about it um but i'm pretty psyched about that that bodes very well, I think. So I feel like if we solve some more explicit equations about projecting those alignment points, we may just be in the money. That may just be, that just may, may be just fine, right? Now on the hopping front, yeah, like that part, the hop should go up, should be displacing the entities in Y. Uh, and it's not at the moment, and I don't really know why. Um, but that's great. So I think that's all good. Um, I didn't save those out. Look, we're, we're going to have to go through and do all those. Uh, and then we can also attach the bodies to the to these orphans and stuff as well. Uh, and the cats and all that stuff. So that will be good. Um, I think we're in good shape. All right. Um, and again, looking at that, so the reason that's clipping in right now, I think is because this hop is actually wrong. And the debug camera is what told us that, right? The hop is supposed to be going up and down, right? But right now it's not doing that, right? Right, the hop is going backwards. The hop's supposed to be going in Z. Uh, why the hop isn't going in Z, I don't actually know. Probably old school ideas about how the 2D stuff was working uh, is really why that's happening. So if I go and fix that, I'm wondering if we get uh, an improvement here. So there's some code in here for that sort of thing. You can see this sort of nonsense here. Um, I don't actually see quite what this is doing. What's the ATT there for entity P? The A, so yeah, I mean, that's just totally broken, right? Like it's, it's actually, it's actually always not that, right? Um, so I, I, I mean, I, you know, I feel like this is what should have been happening there, probably, right? Um, and really, I don't know that I like the fact that this is actually displacing the entity P per se, because I kind of want it to really more displace, uh, yeah. Why is that going underneath? Yeah, I don't really remember how this code is supposed to work at all, by the way. Um, don't hold that against me. Uh, but that's how the hopping should actually be working. Uh, and man, that's nice and clean. That looks, that looks great. Let's see how we do on the stairs. We got we to gotta set the rest of our alignment points. Uh, we'll do that soon. I'd like to do that so it can look cool. That just looks great.
Oh man, yeah, this engine's looking nice. I still think our import pipe is a little borked, uh, but we're getting there, right? We're gonna do all the alignment points. We'll see how it is, uh, and then we'll clean up. We'll clean up anything that's broken when we do that. All right, I think that's a good place to call it for today. Um, and again, we're, we're not quite done with that. That code is, is a little janky right now. So we're, we're gonna wanna make that code, you know, tune that up a little bit. But that confirms to me that, you know, overcomplicating the problem is not necessary. Uh, I think we can just use that technique of spanning those things out. Uh, and I think it'll be good. Oh, um, did I really? Okay, sorry about the label, my bad. Uh, I will fix that. Or I'll try to fix that. I don't actually know how to fix some of that stuff. Uh, is that better? Hopefully, maybe, possibly. Are we going to switch to Remedy for Handmade Hero soon? Um, so, I don't know when we will switch to it. Uh, there's still some things that aren't quite right in it and I'm a little worried about using it on stream because it still has some bugs that like make the debug inspection wrong or whatever. And so I'm okay kind of dog fooding that uh, when I have tons of time to work on stuff like when I'm working eight hours a day on something because I want to get it better. So I'm trying it and when I find those things I just report them. On Hand Me Hero when we only have two hours I don't know that I really want to do that. Um, so I'm just waiting till it's a little more solid. Uh, there's not many problems yet left of that nature, but there's definitely some. And so until it's like more reliable about showing, you know, stepping the code and showing the right stuff, it's just, it's a little bit off. Uh, and so, you know. So we will. Uh, but uh, yeah. Gary Johansson says, one of the reasons I became briefly enthusiastic about WinDebug Preview is the ability to record a trace of a running program and then send that trace to someone else. And they can look at the exact debug session you were looking at rather than having to reproduce a bug spending possibly a long period of time. To me, that sounds like a silver bullet way to reproduce a bug. Can you think of any reason why we want to conclude that the feature is a silver bullet for reproducing bugs? Um, I guess... I don't know what the term silver bullet means in this case. Uh, so it does seem like a good feature, but silver bullet, I don't know. The problem is that usually you have two kinds of bugs. Bugs that are easy to repro and bugs that are hard to repro. Easy to repro bugs, there is still some benefit to something like this because, hey, I don't have to send you like a buildable version of the thing or 
you know, whatever. I don't have any of the art assets to reproduce it or something. I can just record the trace and maybe that works, right? Uh, so there's something to be said for that. But uh, it's limited. For hard to repro bugs, I don't know that it helps you at all. Because hard to repro bugs are just hard to get repro cases for at all. So what are the chances that you happen to turn debug recording on when the bug happened? Probably pretty low. And so the problem is, unless the debug recording is always on and just ubiquitous and just works, I don't think it's really a silver bullet, right? And when debugs recording is definitely not an always on kind of feature. Uh, so I would say at the moment, the closest thing to a repro silver bullet is probably something more like what we have in Handmade Hero where you could just leave it on all the time if you wanted to, where it just records user input and can play it back directly. Um, that you could afford to leave on all the time. Uh, and if you extended that to do some recording to try and help you uh, make it so that runs would be more exactly reprobable, maybe that would work. Uh, but again, it's just not, until like the recording is ubiquitous, always on and free, I don't think it really changes the equation that much. Because the hard part about hard to repro bugs is that you only know you hit one at long after it was too late to turn on recording. And I don't think this changes it that much. Um, does that help? Does that make sense? So far, it seems like all the animations are programmatically moving static sprites. Is there any plan to include preset or artistic creative animations? Uh, we probably won't. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty much a programming stream here. So, you know, uh, I, I don't really want to put a lot of art uh, stress on the art. Um, the other thing, I guess, is this game is supposed to be one where it's easy to add new things to it. So I don't really want to set the bar high for animation. I want you to have to draw the smallest number of things necessary to add something new to the game. That's kind of another criteria. And so if you start having frames of animation, that just really increases the cost uh, for people to add like a new item or a new enemy. So I'd like to keep those really low, right? Um, that's, that's really all I could say. Uh, but no, I saw the rendering code for a bit, and it seems that the vertices and indices for the cubes and quads are generated each frame on the CPU and put into a big VBO, which is set to stream draw. Is this correct? And if yes, what was the decision to do it that way? Uh, so the reason we do it that way is because we have a, it's a game with very low geometry load, right? Um, so the, the number of things we draw with, cube, with the cubes and the sprites is very low. Uh, that's generally true of a 2D game. It's just not that many things. And so there isn't really much of a reason for us to spend time managing GPU memory for no reason, because we just it's just not a bottleneck. So introducing something <clears throat> like static buffers that we manage just increases the chance that we have bugs and work on less cards and doesn't really do much for us uh, because we don't we don't spend a lot of time transferring that stuff right textures we do spend time transferring and so that's why we try to keep them cached on the card as much as possible uh, vertices we just don't have that problem uh, and so that's our current situation now we also have the situation that uh, we may have lots of particles uh, and particles are things that we will probably try to compress more, but we still will probably have to stream them out every frame because we are going to move them on the CPU side mostly. So you can't really use a static buffer for those either. If you wanted to do particle simulation on the GPU, which you can do, then you could change it. But for right now, I don't have any plans to do that either. Because again, even with a couple, you know, 10,000 particles maybe on the screen, we probably still wouldn't be stressing the pipe to the graphics card very much. What's your take on profilers versus do-it-yourself in-game profiling? I've always found do-it-yourself in-game profiling to be better. 
What are some decent profiles that you know of or have used? Um, I tried to use Very Sleepy. It didn't really work. Uh, the multi-threading just didn't seem to work. It just gave really ridiculous results that I knew weren't true. Um, so I'm not sure what was up with that. Uh, I've tried to use VTune. It's a mess. Uh, I haven't ever tried telemetry. So Rad ships a thing called telemetry. Um, that looks more sane, unsurprisingly, because, hey, like... Um, Rad's been working on it for a while, so it's better. Uh, but I haven't tried it myself, so I don't really know. But it looks more like the kind of thing that I would do, right? Like, it, it records a bunch of things, and then you can kind of, like, look at them and go, show me what a frame looked like. Uh, and that seems, you know, seems like something that's more useful. So uh, I guess we don't have any more questions, it looks like. Oh, wait, what do I think about Python? You talking about the language? Um, so I've only really ever looked at Python like twice. And it was someone else's project. Uh, I guess what I would say is it looked like yet another super janky high-level language that is mostly only interesting because people have written a lot of libraries for it. Like it looked like probably slightly better than PHP, but basically the exact same thing. Um, like a janky language, not particularly well thought out, uh, certainly not doesn't perform well, very slow. Um, but lots of libraries, so you can do things quickly if the library does what you want, right? That's about all I could tell about it from the limited amount that I've used it. Do you think there's any value in keeping the concept of registers in the higher level language? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, if I were designing a language, you would act absolutely be able to essentially program assembly language directly in it and then scale out to, like, so basically you could do register allocation yourself at any point if you wanted to. That would totally be something I would do. How do I feel about dynamically typed languages? Um, I feel like dynamic typing is good for certain situations, but you definitely don't want it to be the only thing you have. So if you have dynamic typing, uh, that's fine. But if you don't, allow static typing as well, I probably won't like your language because there's way too many bugs. There's lots of unnecessary bugs in languages that don't have static typing analysis. Maybe that's before, but have you looked at Ponylang? No, I do not know Ponylang. The fact that your name is Useless Pony seems to suggest that Ponylang must not be very good. If it is useless, Does the game load levels from files? Uh, no, it generates levels itself. Or I should say will generate levels itself. At the moment, it only generates a few simple things that we told it to generate. Um, but we will be expanding on that. And there will be no level editor at all. It's not a game where you edit levels. I feel like with the number of times people ask me, like, what do you think about this random language that's very esoteric? I feel like I should start just making up languages and answering them, right? Or 
Like, everyone should just program in Gronk. Like, Gronk is obviously the best language. It has all the best things in it. Like, why aren't we just programming this game in Gronk? Right? Yeah, Rust is, I mean, Rust is probably a fine language, but, you know, it's not as good as Iron Ore. Iron Ore is a way better language. Um, uh, also, uh, the, uh, the the Zinc Oxide language is very good. Um, Dihydrogen Monoxide is one of my favorite languages. It's got a ton of good stuff in it. Um, you know, because Rust has the borrow checker, which people like to talk about. Um, but the, but, uh, zinc oxide is a way better language and, uh, the borrow checker has a lot of limitations. Zinc oxide has the, uh, theft police feature. The theft police is like way better than the borrow checker. Um, and, uh, and similarly, like, like the garbage collection features are, are like, like Go's garbage collection is terrible. Whereas zinc oxide has actually, um, recycling and composting it has memory composting uh and memory composting is like way more powerful than garbage garbage collection right uh because one of the problems that you get in in languages like go that focus on garbage collection is that uh eventually there's uh you run out of raw materials right so you know you're collecting the garbage collecting garbage collecting garbage putting it in uh into the landfill segment and then eventually you know either you run out of space in the landfill segment uh, or you end up in a situation where you just don't have any raw materials anymore at all, right? Um, so, you know, in a language like Go, all of the memory has to come from the memory garden. The memory garden is planted at startup time. And uh, after you harvest all of the memory in the memory garden, and your garbage collector has collected all of that used memory and thrown it away in the landfill segment, uh, that's it, right? I mean, the program just stops. I mean, basically, uh, not, not to mention all the health problems. And so one of the things about zinc oxide, which makes it far superior, um, or also, I, the, uh, I don't know if you guys have looked at StopLang. StopLang is, is kind of like Go, but with composting, with memory composting, right? Because they recognized the fact um, that, you know, you, you have this sort of inherent problem uh, with garbage collection where all of the code just just ends up in a landfill and, and there's you know all, all of all of that memory just ends up in the landfill after it's used and it's, it's a really big problem so stop laying but also zinc oxide because zinc oxide is really like way better uh right um stop laying was kind of just only internal uh uh to to fugal um and you know they they sort of have it out there but it's not really whereas uh Zinc oxide was more of like an open language, took more feedback from the academic community. We all know how good the academic community is at designing languages. Very good. The fact that they never write any code doesn't, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be held against them. Uh, so anyway, zinc oxide has, it, in that, has the memory composting. So what that allows you to do is after you use uh, some memory from the memory garden, which obviously, you know, all the memory has to go through a memory garden at some point uh, in order to, to uh, have the memory be nitrogen fixated when it's initially... Uh, created. Uh, unless you're in, in Plisk, obviously Plisk code and data are interchangeable and you can, and you know, everything, everything is a plip uh, in that language. So that's like a different kind of language. So I would, I would say, uh, yeah, don't, don't take that one too seriously. Uh, it's just a little bit weird, but assuming that you're using zinc oxide or stop lang, um, you know, that, that composite feature is really important because you know, then instead of all of the garbage collected memory just getting thrown away, all of that, uh, you know, that, that nutrient rich used memory is put into a bin, uh, right? It's put into a memory bin until it kind of has a chance to let, you know, usually what, and, and I, I know this seems weird, but this is, 
very serious security research was done on both stop lang and zinc oxide. And so a lot of those other languages that you're, that you're talking about there, uh, a lot of those other languages, they don't appreciate the fact that there's a lot of other uh, malicious code normally running on the machine. There's like malware, you know, viruses, but those things are actually helpful, right? Because uh, what those things can do is if you just give them your used memory, then what will happen is those malwares will actually, they will metabolize the used memory and turn it back into re memory you can use in your actual program, right? So a typical language like, like Stoplang or Zinc Oxide that has some of these more modern memory composting features, they'll take that used memory after you, know, you use it in your actual program to do some computations and store some things in, they'll put it into the memory composting bin. And that bin is essentially, you could think of it as a memory sandbox, right? That is running all of the malware on your machine and it's, it's allowing that composted memory, right? to be metabolized by the malware in, back into usable memory. And so that is a really, uh, you know, again, very cutting edge, uh, very, very, very cutting edge language feature that things like Stop Lang and Zinc Oxide have. Uh, and, you know, it's one of the reasons why, you know, those are really great languages. I can see why everyone always comes on the stream and asks me what I think of them. Uh, let's see here. All right, I think we'll wrap it up for the day. <clears throat> I think we will wrap it up for the day. Pretty pleased with how that went today. I don't, I don't mind telling you. Despite my lack of mental grasp on the ATAN2 in my imagination, how I always seem to get the basis wrong. Other than that, we did pretty good today. All right, thank you everyone for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's a pleasure coding with you. As always, if you want to follow the series at home, you can always go to handmadehero.org and pre-order the game. It comes with all the source code even today, so you can play around with it uh, and learn from the series, hopefully. Uh, I will be back here next week to probably, I guess, so I think what we want to do is do the full version of that alignment code that I uh, just played around with today so we can track that off our list and then we can go like align all our sprite assets and have a nice, like put all that stuff in the game. And that'll give us a chance to turn the crank a few times on the asset system and get the bugs out. I know there's still bugs in there. I guarantee it was just, we put, there's, it's just really big and there's a lot of complexity in there now. I'm sure we've got some things wrong going on there. So we need to like actually get a really good monocle out, a really good um, evil genius monocle out and like look at that code and, and make sure that it's just right. Uh, but that's really uh, you know where we're at and I'm happy about that. So I think the game will look a lot nicer then because we'll be able to align all the stuff and make it, make it good. Maybe after that we'll, we'll ping back over to lighting uh, strip out some of the stuff, make a simpler version of it so we can run it real real time on, on lower end machines and also do a wider version. And then I think we're checked off, man. I think we're, we're looking great. I think we're, I think we're ready to populate the game with stuff, uh, hopefully, right? I don't know what else we'd have to do. Oh, we want to do sounds, right? We want to do some, uh, we want to put sounds into the pack files. So that's another thing we got to do. So we do have some stuff left. Uh, so we'll be back on that. Hope you join me for that next weekend. Until then, have fun programming, anyone. Have fun programming, everyone. I'll see you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.